All right. I will go ahead and start in three, two, one. Good evening and welcome to the January 13, 2020 FEMA Community College Board meeting. Um, the first item is, a, is our annual and regular governing board meeting uh, and is the election of the Arizona Association. Oh, excuse me. Our first item of business is our roll call. So, uh, Mr. Sullivan, if you could read the roll. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just so everybody knows what to expect, I'm just going to do this in numerical order of the districts. Uh, Ms. Ripley. Ms. Ripley, I believe you're muted. Here. Mr. Klinko. Present. Ms. Garcia. Here. Dr. Hay. Here. Mr. Gonzalez. Here. Mr. Chair, all board members are present. Okay, now is our, onto our new business. Uh, the first item is the election of the Arizona Association of Community College Trustee Representative for the 2021. Uh, Mr. Sylvan, could you uh, just read the recommended uh, item and maybe the public comment very quickly? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Chancellor recommends that the Governing Board appoint one board member to serve as a representative and one board member to serve as an alternate to the Arizona Association of Community College Trustees. Um, essentially, this ensures that Pima Community College has representation at the uh, statewide body that tries to coordinate the work of the 10 different um, community college districts. Okay. So as by way of a little background, I've, I served uh, as a representative to the organization last year, and I've been serving as the chair of the organization by helping to revive and revamp it. Mr. Hanna also served on uh, as the alternate to the organization. Um, is there a nomination? From yeah, Mr. Mr. Klinko, I'd like to make a nomination, if I may. Yes, that's Dr. Hay. I would like to nominate uh, Mr. Klinko as AACC representative and Ms. Garcia as the alternate. Accept. You accept that? Okay, terrific. So, uh, with the accepting, and I also accept. Is there um, is there a second on the motion? Second. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion? Okay. Hearing none. All in favor of signify. So all in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Ms. Ripley, I didn't. Aye. Okay, <laughs> terrific. <laughs> Uh, passes <laughs> unanimously. The uh, the next item is the election of advisory committee board meeting board members and representatives. Um, and just by way of a little background, um, we have two uh, advisory committees. One is the human resources advisory committee, and the other is the finance and audit committee. We have two representatives from the board on each of these committees. Currently, Ms. Garcia and myself are serving on the uh, finance and audit committee. And uh, Mr. Gonzalez and Mr. Hanna were serving on the uh, Human Resources Advisory Committee. So I'm not sure how we want to take a, a motion or if, um, um, if we want to do it as a package or if we'd like to do it individually per committee or if anybody um, you know, would, is interested in changing their role or if people are interested in continuing, um, I could propose a motion and, uh, and then see if there's a second. Okay, so I would move that uh, that the uh, Pima Community College Governing Board appoint to the Human Resource Advisory Committee, uh, Mr. Gonzalez and Ms. Ripley, and to the Finance and Audit Committee, Ms. Garcia and uh, Mr. Plinko. Is there a second? Second. Okay, uh, is there any discussion? Does anybody have any concerns? Okay, Dr. Hay, no. you're not serving on a committee again. Oh darn, yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> It really, really crushes my heart. Hey, so all uh, in favor of the motion uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, anyone opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Um, so we're, we'll just gavel in and we'll just gavel out and gavel in to reconvene uh, the open session of our regular meeting. Um, item 4.1 is, uh, is uh, the call to order for the regular meeting, and we're going to begin with the public comments. Uh, the Pima Community College Governing Board welcomes public comment on issues within the jurisdiction of the college. Generally, the total time for public comment will be limited to 45 minutes, and comments will be limited to three minutes per individual. These time limits may be modified by the board chair or board individuals 
Uh, sharing comments are expected to communicate with decorum and respect. Individuals who engage in disorderly conduct or who use divisive or insulting language may have their time reduced or concluded by the board chair at the conclusion of the public comment. Individual board members may respond to criticism made by those who address the board, may ask the staff to review the matter, or may ask that the matter be put on any future agenda. Members of the board, however, may not discuss or take legal action on matters raised during the public comment unless the matter is properly noticed for discussion and legal action. Finally, be advised that internal college processes are available to students and employees for communication. Uh, we have two uh, we have two individuals on our uh, on our call to the audience this evening. The first is uh, Guinea Selenright. Can you sell right? Okay. Hi, yes, this is Jenny. No I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, Chair Klinko, board members, Chancellor Lambert, colleagues and guests. My name is Jenny Selton Wright, and I am the current ACES president. ACES, the Association of Classified Exempt Staff, is the exempt employees representation group at the college. On behalf of the ACES officers and its members, I would like to welcome Catherine Ripley to the Pima Community College Board of Governors. ACES has long enjoyed a positive and productive working relationship with the college board and administration, and we look forward to continuing this work with Ms. Ripley. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next is Sage Bukai Makala. Uh, Damien, that's our uh, student rep. Okay, so that's going to be during the uh, rep. Okay, so it looks like we only had one. Uh, we only had one uh, call to the uh, uh, audience. Um, so thank you very much. Um, next is our remarks by the governing board. Um, uh, so each of us have um, uh, a few minutes to uh, to give updates um, and provide summaries of recent college activities. Um, I want to thank everybody and welcome them to a new year and a new semester. Um, I know the uh, challenges that the college and the nation face both in COVID and politically have um, really stretched the bounds of, um, of, I think, all expectations. I thought 2020 was rough. 2021 is proving to be quite challenging. So uh, I am particularly grateful to all of the uh, college employees and staff and administrators um, and everyone involved in the institution for their continued commitment to assuring that the educational resources and quality here in Pima County um, are strong, and we continue to strive to be the premier community college um, that we are on our way to becoming. So I just want to thank each and every one of you. Um, secondly, I would uh, like to welcome uh, Kat Ripley uh, as our new elected member of the board. Uh, I look forward to working with you and, uh, and our time together uh, advancing this important institution. So welcome, Dr. Hay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Klinko. I too want to welcome uh, Kat Ripley to the board. It's just fantastic. Um, we're just very thrilled to have you on the board and looking forward to working with you closely. Again, I want to give a shout out as I have been in the last few uh, meetings to all the faculty and the staff for their hard work and, and continuing uh, to offer the highest quality uh, education to our students during these difficult times. And hopefully we'll all get uh, vaccination soon. So and that's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Gonzalez. The same as uh, mentioned before, I want to welcome uh, the staff and and, and all the, the administration reference to helping us, uh, not only the uh, the employees, but all students as well too in, the, in this uh, time of crisis. I know it's been challenging for all, but I think uh, if, we, if we do the proper thing, I think it'll, it'll be best. But also Ms. Ripley, I thank you for being, I congratulate you for being elected and uh, welcome to our to the board as well too and we'll talk soon Ms. Garcia yes I want to welcome our our new board member Ms. Kath Kathleen Ripley I look forward to working with you I want to welcome everyone in attendance and would like to also thank everyone that works in support of our college I would also like to express my sincere condolences and prayers to anyone that has been affected by this pandemic. 
May we have a better year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Garcia. And Ms. Ripley. Hi, thank you uh, everybody on this call and everybody at Pima Community College uh, for a really warm welcome. I was sworn in yesterday by Superintendent Dustin Williams and it was safe, it was short and it was sweet. So it was perfect. And so I'm super excited. Now it's real. This is my first meeting. I'm uh, as a retired military officer, I must say I'm really excited to come into even in the midst of chaos in the world now and last year, I'm excited that, and I'm very impressed that Pima Community College uh, has taken care of its people, its staff and its faculty and students, and that safety, both physical and emotional is being uh, addressed. So I'm really excited about that and proud. I'm actually proud of that when I look at other schools and other institutions. Um, and I know this is gonna be challenging. There's so much on the plate and a lot of moving parts, but I'm so happy to be here. So thank you. Well, we're really glad that you're here and welcome. Okay, our next is our uh, item 5.1, administrative reports. Our first report is an enrollment update with David Ariano, our Dean of Enrollment Manage Management. Mr. Uh, Chairman Lambert, do you wanna provide an introduction? Yes, yeah, so uh, Mr. Chair, if it's okay, I'd like to reverse the order. And, and I think the reason for that is uh, the presentation by Dr. Richman would provide a nice overview umbrella in which uh, David's presentation would better align so, so Nick, if you're able to put yours up first, I think that would be the better approach. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. Chair Klinko, members of the board, chancellor, colleagues and guests, it's my pleasure to be here with you this evening to share with you a review of enrollment trends at Pima Community College. If you give me a moment to share my screen. Can you all see, see my slides okay? Okay, good. Okay, so in September of last year, I shared with the board an update regarding Pima County population. And we talked about some big picture observations. And the figure I talked about at length before, but we look at our non-Hispanic and Hispanic residents by age and by gender. And we can see that in general, Hispanic residents within our community are younger. We have a concentration of older non-Hispanic residents, which is unsurprising um, as we are a retirement community. And we have this narrowing at the top and at the base. And that narrowing at the base, as we discussed before, is related to the fertility rate and the declines in that. Now, while this gives us a snapshot, this is one piece in a puzzle that touches on lots of different areas and topics. And so what I'm going to spend a few minutes doing is talking in a bit more detail about Pima specific enrollment the trends we have seen, and talk a little bit about what some of that means. So here you see in this chart, the annual headcount by year for Pima from 2000 through 2001 to the most recent year that's been submitted to IPEDS, which is the Integrated Post-Secondary Education Data System. And I use data to this system because we're gonna look at some other institutions as well. And this is a mandated report that we all submit to the federal government. Now I noted a few key events for the institution here for reference. But as you can see in the earliest years here, we had a slight increase in enrollment starting from about 50,000 students per year. And I'm gonna use the term headcount and enrollment interchangeably here. For internal purposes, we would consider this headcount when we submit this to IPEDS, they refer to this as a 12 month enrollment report. Um, internally, we use those terms differently, but because that's IPEDS language, I may periodically use enrollment. But throughout, I'm talking about the same thing. Unduplicated student counts within a given year, regardless of the classes they're taking. Now, we saw an increase in enrollment around 2008 uh, through 2010 associated with the Great Recession, as we're seeing across a lot of institutions. And then since that point in time, we have seen fairly, fairly large initially decreases in headcount, and then things have been flattening off in recent years. Now, if I compare this, um, so we see our headcount compared with the total for Arizona Community Colleges, 
The Arizona colleges are shown by the red line and the labels for them are down the left. And then you have ours down the right in the blue bar still. There are some similarities between these trends, but also a notable difference. So you'll see the trend pre-Great Recession is relatively similar. There was also an increase for the Arizona colleges. But the drop for those institutions after the Great Recession has not been as pronounced as it has been specifically for Pima Community College. Now, we can dig into this a little bit more detail. Um, in the case here, we're comparing Pima with the Maricopa Community Colleges up in Phoenix. And I'm looking at the percent change between three different points in time. The end point in every case is the most recent year we have available to us through iPads, so 2018 through 19. But we're looking the furthest back in time, then slightly closer to present day and then closer still. So if we look at the percent change from 2009 through to the most recent year, Pima is down 45% in our 12 month enrollment as reported to iPads. This is the second highest drop across this group of colleges, including Pima and the Maricopa districts. And only Gateway Community College has a higher drop in uh, headcount, 46%. Now, if we look at the same endpoint, but we look from 2013-14, so this is a shorter period of time now, we're pulling closer to present day for this uh, window. We still see the second highest drop for Pima, 23% between those points in time. And again, Gateway um, is the one institution with a higher drop at 26%. If we look over the last few years, however, this is that period where we saw that flattening out for Pima that I highlighted in the previous chart. For this one, we see the only the seventh highest drop. So we're down 2% between those two points in time. And you'll notice a number of the other well, the number of the Maricopa colleges are seeing higher drops in that time. And what this is telling us is that we lost a lot of enrollment immediately after the Great Recession. But as we've got to closer to present day, our enrollment has flattened out and we're actually in a slightly healthier position in terms of uh, enrollment change, headcount change um, for these uh, unduplicated count of students compared to those Maricopa institutions. We know from previous work we've done, um, we leverage a number of algorithms to understand our students and trends. We know that there's been periods of time in Pima's history where we can do a pretty good job uh, forecasting our headcount based on Pima County population and Pima County unemployment. And what you see here is a comparison of our headcount again in the blue bars and then the Pima County median monthly unemployment rate through this period of time. And you can see there's a very clear trend and association. You can, you, it's visible here. We can prove it numerically, but you can see the decline in the unemployment rate compared to our headcount. Things look very different, however, if we look at that period before the Great Recession. So um, it kind of looks like there is something different here compared to here. Now I shared the Maricopa College numbers. If we go back and look at the state, in this case, community college total headcount, again, this is leveraging the iPads data and the 12 month enrollment report. We see a similar story, though the trend over here is a little bit different. The enrollment statewide has dropped quite proportionately the same way that we see with the uh, unemployment rate. Now there's a few key things that are different in the world. I mean, there's a, a number of them actually. I know my colleague, David Ariana, will also speak to this in his presentation. The world is a very different place now to the world pre-Great Recession. And that was true before the pandemic. I mean, it's even more true now. One of the key changes has been the growth of competition for students. Now, competition comes in a variety of different forms. For purposes of this slide, I've looked only at MOOCs so these massively online courses. We're looking at the count of courses, and this went essentially from nothing in 2012 to the data in here through 2019, we're up to about 12, 14,000 courses. And these courses are not like our traditional classroom courses where you have 30 students in a given point of time in a particular class. These are huge courses with very high numbers of students. There's a growth through these platforms of offering credentials from particular employers and professional certificates. And so they are moving to become a viable competitor for us, as well as changes in technology 
opening up additional competition across institutions that are not physically located within our community, but which have strong online offerings that are available to our students as well. So competition is a key factor. In addition, um, as you've perhaps all read, there have been changes in op opinions regarding the importance of a college degree. This shows up in a number of different research studies by different entities. In this case, I'm showing you some results from a Gallup study. And here, there's a number of different results available on this website, but this looks at those, the proportion of respondents who specified that a college education was very important comparing 2013 through 2019. And if we look at all US adults, it was 70% who considered a college education very important in 2013. That had dropped to 51% by 2019. And for us, the 18 through 29 year old population is really important. We have a high proportion of our students within that age range. And for them, it's declined from 74% to 41%. And when we think in terms of broadening education competition with these different kind of education offerings through um, be it Udemy or Coursera or some of the other institutions that advertise in our community. And when we combine that with this reduction in the sense of importance of a college education, that speaks a little bit, I think, to some of the dynamics we see in the enrollment numbers that we are experiencing. And of course, also, I mentioned this at the beginning, I'll mention it now as well. It's well observed that there is a declining birth rate within our community actually across the full United States um, and other countries as well. We are not yet at the point where we're being significantly impacted by the drop in the birth rate, but over the course of the next five or six years, we will be more impacted by this. So combined with the declining perception of the value of education, combined with the growth in competition, and then the reduction in students coming out of our high schools because of the decline in birth rate, it creates yet more challenges for the institution as we think about how do we support enrollment? How do we ensure we're meeting the educational needs of our community? So this slide summarizes a few of the points I was just talking about. And I also wanted to add in the scenarios that I shared with the board in November. In this case, I'm presenting the headcount equivalents of the proportional changes that we discussed last time. But you can perhaps see we have this big drop here. Um, we don't have full annual enrollment for this year, but I approximated that drop at 20%. Um, we saw about 15% in the fall, a little bit higher than that currently for the spring, but for purposes of this, I set that to 20%. And you can see scenario one, which is the less optimistic outlook that we continue to experience drops. Scenario two, where we're flat with a slight increase, and scenario three, where things increase further. And these are consistent with the kinds of trends we were experiencing pre-pandemic. But of course, the big question for us as we move forward into the next year is how is enrollment and headcount going to respond as the vaccine becomes available and as we start to hopefully shift out of this pandemic as we move into the summer and the fall. That continues to be a big unknown for us. It's something we're watching carefully, um, we're studying carefully, but we're continuing to be in uncharted territory. So how this plays out um, in some respects, we have to watch and see and then do as much as we can to uh, lead to changes in our student enrollment patterns and the way we engage with different communities, which I know uh, my colleague will speak about in the next few minutes. And with that, that's all the information I have the board for the board today. Um, I will be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Klinko, a quick question. So Nick, what, what is the industry saying about um, COVID baby bumps? You know, that's a very interesting question. Um, I have heard different things about how this may um, impact us moving forward. Um, I can check and follow up and find the most recent comments in this, on this topic. Um, I don't think anybody really knows because there's no data yet, but, but the hypothesis is right is there may be more babies at least in the next year or so. <laughs> Yeah, I've also heard the opposite, the, the because opposite, of concern right. about leveraging healthcare and needing to go into the hospitals and things like that. Right. 
there's might be a further reduction. So I, I don't know. Okay, wait and see. <laughs> right. Okay. It, is, it doesn't really Im impact your numbers. That's a great presentation, though. Thank you. You're muted, Mr. Klinko. Yeah, I'm having a little bit of tr technical trouble. I'm actually going to have to sign off and um, and sign back on um, because I can't see any of the uh, the tool set to be able to uh, manage the Zoom. Um, but I do have a question, uh, Dr. Richmond. Uh, before I do that, um, you know, clearly we want to be at scenario number three at a minimum. Um, so, what are the you know in in your view? Uh, could well, could you talk about really what it is that we're going to need to do to get to scenario three? Uh, and I. I'm sure the next report's going to touch on that too. But can you also talk about the changing competitive climate in the marketplace in Tucson? You know, there's, you know, new institutions coming here. I mean, people see opportunity for market share. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, that is taking away from some of our, from some of our opportunities. So could you talk a little bit about that while I try to get this sorted out? Absolutely. So, um, so I'll start with the second one of those. So one of the big challenges we have in terms of the changing competitive landscape is the impact of technology. Um, it used to be that you would attend the institution kind of close to where you live because that was what was convenient to access. There are so many things that can be done through online education these days that that barrier simply doesn't exist anymore. And as different organizations seek to kind of, I mean, their businesses, right? I'll mention Coursera as one example. Of course, there are others. They're working very hard to bring online um, credentials associated with particular companies. You can get IBM professional certificates, for example. There are lots of things you can do through these providers. And because they can be really flexible in their delivery method, um, and oftentimes since, depending on financial aid and a particular institutions, they don't necessarily have the regulations associated with them that we do. Now, the association, the associated issue with that is they're not necessarily as good at assessment as we are demonstrating competences. So it's, they have some advantages, but they have some weaknesses, but there's considerable effort across either the for-profit institutions, some of the other big online competitors that we face. And I always worry from a competitive point of view that we're kind of like a few months from somebody like Amazon or Google announcing that they're going to move heavily into the education space. And that could be a significant challenge for us institutionally. In terms of what we can do to support um, increases in enrollment, um, I know my colleague is going to speak to this at length. The thing that stands out to me, I spend a lot of time looking at college data we can we can look now we have the data now comparing the current point in time enrollment for the upcoming spring with the equivalent point last spring and because of the reporting infrastructure we have we can look at a very fine scale detail and i we can tell how many of our female students we've lost how many of our hispanic students we've lost and we can look in combination so it enables us to see the areas where we're most significantly losing numbers and we can use that to think about, okay, so we've lost, let's say, 50% of this particular population is a big population. What can we do specifically to engage with that group? So I think there are ways we can leverage the data to help us make good decisions as we think about how to move this around. And I'm always delighted when um, David speaks because he always starts with one of our screenshots of our daily registration report because I know his area is very data informed. So I know he's using that information to help kind of guide some of the things um, that uh, happens in his area. But there are clear areas that we can identify where we're losing numbers. And so if we can think and engage with the community to figure out what we might do to turn that around, that gives us some opportunities. And clearly that is very urgent. Are there um, that engagement is, uh, are there other comments from board members? Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, let me, let so. me kind of amplify uh, what uh, Dr. Richmond is talking about. And it's, and it has, it's really rooted in the things you've seen us doing up till now. The question is how, how quickly are we able to get things in place? So if you look at the shift, the shift is going away from, from, degrees to skills. So it's skills required, degrees optional. 
So kind of keep that as a way of thinking about this, right? And so you have a lot of employers now more focused on the skill than the degree itself. And before the longest time, the degree was the proxy for the skill. And because of the advances in technology and the refinements of things, folks are able to better calibrate the skill that they need versus that degree serving as the proxy. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. If you look at it from a population standpoint, demographic, the, the larger opportunity is in the adult working age population in terms of uh, enrollment. It's not the uh, traditional high school age. The competition is most fierce for that population. Uh, that's, that, that's a captured audience. Everyone knows them, et cetera. And in the state of Arizona, we have one of the lowest college going rates for high school students in the nation. And, and so, so we have to keep that in mind too. So what, our, what we've been doing at Pima is recognizing that the opportunity is the adult population so that's why, in part, the investment in career technical education, workplace relevant training that could attract the incumbent worker to come in and to uh, upskill and reskill, and, and that we play a vital role in that. So we've been building that infrastructure. So keep that in mind. We also have, have recognized that online is a growing part. Online is really, when you strip it all back, is really the only growing substantial part of higher education whether you're talking four year or two year or otherwise. And, and so we've invested in building that infrastructure as well. And so we're putting the right things in place. Now it's just a matter of how quickly can we get these all optimized to then leverage the opportunities that are here in this community. But the opportunities are gonna get tougher and tougher as we go forward. Can I well, ask one more question, Damien? Yes, Sorry. Not, Mary, please. So um, Nick and Lee, how do we compete on a price point? For these online students. So, uh, so Dr. Hay, um, the price point—that's where we are. We they can't compete with us in that right. sense. But here's the challenge. So you look at ASU, right? The way they market themselves is with at, when you take all the aid into consideration, all the scholarships, their price point gets closer to ours. Uh, so that's what we have to be mindful of is that, that they are able to offset some of those other costs or at least present it in a way that appears that way. Uh, but from a pure cost head to head, it's hard for them to compete with us from a price. But that's only one measure of why someone comes. It's not all about the price. Right, but, so, but for the, the business of higher ed, and I know we don't talk about a business, but, but it, it often is a business and, and Ms. Ripley will understand this as well, coming from her background, is if, if we can actually sell our online content to those beyond Pima County and then subsidize our Pima County students who want to be in, on hand learning how to fix airplanes and be nurses, then that's the way it all balances out, right? It's, 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 it's the volume of, of selling our product to those who don't live in Pima County to subsidize the rest of the enterprise. Is that, is that accurate? So... Thank you, Dr. Hay, that's, you just hit it. I mean, that's, that's a key part. So think about Southern New Hampshire University. They were all but out of business and they took their resources and put it all online. So now they are the, arguably the largest provider of online education uh, in the country or among the largest. And by the way, they have an operation in Tucson now. Uh, and that now subsidizes their on-campus operation. So they can still provide that more traditional face-to-face -face piece. So yes, that is uh, th the opportunity for us is there as well. The challenge is, are we too late to, to the party, A, uh, or can we operate our online differently? Because they operate their online differently than they do their face-to-face -face college. And so the more you can shift the way you operate it will make a difference. So, but you're, you're, you're spot on in terms of, your observation. Any other comments? Okay, but Chancellor Lambert, I would just, I mean, I, and I know we have a, another presentation um, that's gonna talk a little bit about this, but again, I just, when we've spoken about this, I am so concerned about the 20% uh, reduction that we've seen. I'm concerned about it because that is a cohort of individuals who may become almost a lost generation uh, of people who may never come back 
uh, because of the circumstances of this pandemic. And, I, and I'm concerned not only for individuals who are missing that educational opportunity and who are going to be years behind in their educational trajectory and work, workforce training, I'm also concerned about how that continues to make our region competitive, uh, meeting the, the needs of the businesses that are here. I mean, they businesses yeah. relocated here because, you know, they are anticipating a workforce. And if a 20% reduction is, is so significant. Um, so if I, I, again, I, you know, would really challenge uh, the team and you to come up with ways of really figuring out who that 20% is and figuring out how we can re-engage with them. Because I think that actually provides an opportunity if we're able to get back quickly, you know, in that scenario, uh, in that scenario three that Dr. Richmond presented, we may actually be able to increase if we were able to really actively re-engage with those people and actually accelerate that opportunity um, for them. So I, I, I am just, I, I, you know, it's one of the things that have really kept me up at night through this pandemic is, um, are those numbers because I'm just concerned about where those individuals are going in our community. So um, I appreciate all your work to do that. So, so Mr. Chair, I, I think you, you're hitting on one of the key facets that we're gonna have to address. So in my recent conversation with the provost, um, uh, we, we talked about the need to strengthen our onboarding around developmental education, because what we're also learning about a lot of these folks, especially coming out of the high schools now, they're, you know, in some cases, maybe even a year behind uh, where they need to be, even though they may graduate, their skill level is not where it needs to be. So we, we need to potentially uh, put more resources to that front end of things. And thankfully, we have the infrastructure. Now it's just moving more resources there. You're gonna hear David talk about some of the, I think you're gonna to touch on this, David, right? Some of the strategies we're, we're already deploying to try to reach as many individuals as we know about. And, and, so, uh, and so I think more resources are gonna be needed to be concentrated in this area. Okay, let's move on to that presentation with um, David Ariano. Hey, Kat, Kat had a question, Damien. Oh, did you? I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Ripley, go ahead. Hi, yeah, uh, just to throw my two cents in as a first, my first meeting. Um, yeah, I would love to see a larger philosophical discussion. I think this is really important. This is the meat and potatoes of what we do. And I think that I, I like that we are talking about the business aspect of it because that's the reality. But as a community college and the only game in town for higher education at the price point that most of our community can afford, I think we have a responsibility to also balance that, the online and not for credit uh, offerings and the certification offerings, which are very important uh, with keeping that pathway open for degrees. I think it's really important. I just wanted to say that out loud. I know that that's being done, but I, there's a lot of moving parts again. And I wanna make sure that we have that philosophy, that larger philosophical discussion about our responsibility to the community and higher education, thanks. Chancellor Lambert, do you wanna address that very briefly before? Right, so uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and, and uh, uh, Ms. Ripley. Uh, one of the things I talk about with my team is full spectrum thinking. And what full, full spectrum thinking is really about is looking at the ands not the ors, right? It's not this versus that. It's how do we balance and weigh all of these pieces so that we become attractive to the largest amount of individuals we can given our resources. So we won't move away from a purely face-to-face -face model, but we have to balance that with the realities of where our students are gravitating to. And then we have to also recognize that as, as you saw Dr. Richmond present, there's, there's less and less students who are necessarily wanting a degree. And so we have to give them a reason for wanting that degree. So what might attract them was not the degree, it's the shorter term opportunities, the non-credit opportunities. Once they get exposed to that, hopefully we turn some of them on to wanting to pursue the degree, but it's not just about the degree, it's about lifelong learning, creating an environment where people wanna constantly come back and to Pima for their reskilling and upskilling. And so that's why having the, the non-credit, the credit, the modularization, all the way up to the degree and, and the post-degree opportunities will allow us to be a more full spectrum 
more full service provider. So that's really where we're, where we're moving. We're too heavily concentrated right now, still on the high school direct side of the equation. Our schedule, you just, all you have to do is look at our scheduling. When do we offer our courses? It's, it's, it's to that population when the market is moving away from that, not all together, but it's moving away from that. So we have to be willing to shift so that we can still be competitive. Thank you, Chancellor Lambert. And I think to uh, Ms. Ripley's point, I think it would be good to have a more in-depth conversation perhaps during a study session coming up um, so we can talk about getting that onto a schedule so we can really have a more robust conversation about some of this. Okay, so without further ado, uh, David Ariano. Thank you, Chairperson Klinko. Let me get set up here. Take it, you all can see my screen there. So uh, good evening, Chairperson of the Board, Board members, Chancellor Lambert, colleagues and guests. My name is David Adiano and I'm the Dean of Enrollment Management. I'm gonna be providing you with an update on enrollment management efforts and continuing the conversation we just had. Um, I am gonna begin with wishing you all a happy new year and uh, welcoming new board member, uh, Catherine Ripley. So welcome. Let's start off with, uh, with a look back at our fall enrollment. When we look at fall 2018 to fall 2019, the college saw increases to headcount enrollment in FTSE. And that was reflective on Nick's slide showing that leveling off of enrollment um, at Pima Community College and within the state. Um, this was a huge and major milestone for us as we saw enrollment stabilize from those year-to-year -year declines that we experienced uh, the last 10 years. When we look at fall 20, uh, we, we have a, it was significantly down from fall 19 due to the pandemic, which unfortunately continues to take a toll on our enrollment, our students and our community. It's important to also recognize that uh, Pima is not alone in these enrollment decreases we have experienced uh, this past fall uh, and continuing on, continuing on this spring. Um, some of the data that I'm showing here is, is uh, courtesy of National Student Clearinghouse. And in figure one, you can see that in the two-year public sector, which composes community colleges, um, you can see enrollment across the nation is down nine and a half percent, which is very alarming uh, compared to fall, nine, fall 19. And then specifically when we hone in on Arizona, we, we see the, the two-year public sector community college as a whole in Arizona experiencing a 17.5% decrease in enrollment year to year. And then finally, when, when we look at that new to higher ed, that first time in college uh, freshman enrollment, uh, we can see that's down across the board in the nation at 18.9%. Uh, but what keeps me up at night, what, what I'm really concerned about is we can clearly see that data um, that it illustrates that people of color are experiencing the largest college uh, enrollment declines in the nation uh, during this pandemic. And, and when we look at those, those figures, we look at our internal data knowing that as a Hispanic serving institution, Hispa Hispanic or Latinx um, uh, population are largest here uh, at Pima Community College. And so identifying ways that we, we can continue to support them. Here I'm, I'm highlighting some of our spring enrollment numbers. So those enrollment declines I'm, I'm highlighting from fall have continued over into spring as, especially as COVID continues to surge in Pima County and in Arizona. Um, we have also seen a slight decrease in the number of admissions application for spring by about, by about 600 uh, applications less uh, compared to the same time last year. So in this virtual environment, these declines are still occurring uh, despite our extensive efforts from our recruiters, from our enrollment advisors, and I would say everybody across the college. Here, I, I really wanna hone in and, and talk about some of those enrollment and uh, retention disruptors that, that we're facing, that the pandemic has created for, for us and many colleges uh, across the country. Um, Nick and, and our chancellor have talked about um, what we've seen in the community college sector with unprecedented enrollment declines uh, during this pandemic. 
Um, we have many students who are still concerned uh, about their health and safety and have opted for gap years, um, reduced course loads, um, and then also to tack on, mental health is also a concern during this pandemic. Um, we have course modalities and we've offered a variety of ways to students uh, to engage with the college and take their courses. But what we're finding is many are not comfortable with those online and, and virtual learning environments. Um, mm -hmm. in, in a specific student that I was working with, uh, Christopher, who, who recently took uh, Calc 2 um, and unfortunately failed in the fall, um, that's something he's waiting for that return to face-to-face to, -face to re enroll and retake that course. So we're seeing that um, anecdotally from our interactions with students. Um, and then finances, right? We look at finances and they're strained in many households. Um, we're seeing many students prioritizing basic needs like housing, food, clothing, uh, and, and sanitation, right? Uh, and, and so another student that I spoke through through our enrollment uh, advising campaign, which I'll touch on in a, in a few slides, um, applied to Pimo, and when we reached out, uh, indicated that they weren't interested at this time, they were gonna be working, they're actually working at McDonald's and, and, are, and is essentially making money, earning money and, and waiting for the pandemic to, to uh, reside uh, before returning to college. Um, and then Nick's talked about increased enrollment competition in the form of MOOCs. Um, I have another slide that I will be kind of diving into that, but we're seeing that in Pima County. Um, many of our students are also uh, experiencing unemployment. Um, we've seen unemployment um, at the beginning of the pandemic uh, around 4%. It's jumped up to 12, 13%. And it's kind of been up and down during this last year. And it's kind of settling around that 7, 8, 7 to 8% unemployment rate in Pima County. And, and of those students who are still employed, many that are part-time at, at the institution uh, with us, um, many of those are, are essential <laughs> Right. They're, they're working in uh, retail, they're working in grocery stores, they're working in healthcare, and they're still out there uh, helping us move along as a community. Um, of, of our students that are parents, and we look at that population, right, we have a lot of uncertainty in our K-12 environment. We have um, a lot of student parents who are, are really um, working with those students, um, with, their, with their children uh, who are students in K-12, um, which is really extensive and intensive. Um, some of those uh, Google and Zoom courses for younger children require some parental assistance. And then when we look at our digital divide, we, we've known about that uh, for quite some time. It's been amplified um, in this pandemic. We have many students lacking technology, internet, internet access, um, even struggling with digital literacy um, to how to, to to know how to navigate and learn in these virtual environments. I um, mean, in, in addition, really honing in uh, on some of our community members, um, they're part of multi generational uh, households, right? And, and in some cases, lack the necessary space, uh, quiet time, and in some cases, even a desk to to do well in these learning environments. So those are some of the enrollment and retention disruptors we're seeing at that student level. And, and those are the challenges that we're faced, not, not just here in Pima County, but nationally. Uh, we've talked about the increased competition and the outreach of online programs and institutions. They're essentially blurring our city, our county, our state lines. Um, many of those institutions you see on the screen there, um, they're challenging our, our value proposition, right? Which has, has really been highlighted on access and cost. Um, and they're challenging it through innovation. They're offering cutting edge programming, uh, flexible course scheduling. Um, they have national brand recognition, uh, shorter term uh, programs that, that aren't, that are less restrictive in terms of compliance. Um, and then I won't go through this list um, exhaustively, but you can see those institutions in Arizona are heavily marketing in Pima County. And then we have outside of Arizona, we have you know, large national players um, in the online uh, in the online sector that are really advertising to our students, whether it be through geofencing, direct mailing, um, and as others and, and our chancellor have mentioned, uh, Southern New Hampshire does have a footprint in Tucson um, where, where it's not an actual physical space students go to, they are uh, operating their, their online operations and uh, recruiting students um, here in Pima County. I do, want to, I do want to highlight and talk about some of the positive interventions we've done. So since last March, Student Affairs um, 
really shifted its services from in-person to virtual. Um, this really required a rapid coordination on our end, being innovative, making sure our staff had the training and knowledge um, to work with students in this virtual environment. You know, we've brought in folks from Pima County to, to re-up our knowledge and skills and, and understanding um, how students uh, are dealing with poverty during the pandemic. Um, and really the foundation as we, as we move to those virtual services has been to provide access and equity for all students. Um, and, and again, you can see a lot of the things we've done and continue to do to make sure that we have uh, our students' needs met. Here, I, I really wanna talk about some of the, the various technology platforms that we've utilized. Um, and during that time, when, as we've added technology, we've been very conscientious and, and careful about not adding to that digital divide, making sure that these technologies work with existing technology that students have access to and know how to use. Um, and we've used QList, we've used uh, Black Belt Help, um, a chat bot, Pima Connect, things like that. Um, just to kind of give you an insight into some of those service metrics, since we onboarded QList and our virtual callbacks, we've had over 16,000 interactions with students one-on-one uh, -on -one with advisors, enrollment advisors, program advisors, counselors, um, since July through, through that platform. Um, in the last three months since, uh, since we onboarded with Black Belt Help, um, we've had over 15,000 phone calls come in um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, assisting students with their advising and registration needs. Um, we've had thousands of chats through our chat bot um, and we've, we've essentially activated all, all active students in Pima Connect so our program advisors can engage with them, faculty can engage through early alerts, things like that. So again, we, we, we continue to be uh, student-centered and, and pivot towards the, the needs of our students there. Um, here, I really wanna, I wanna take us back um, and, and revisit the enrollment life cycle. And you, you've probably seen this or, or heard me speak to it. Um, but as we move forward and, and we go through the pandemic and beyond, we really need to think and act holistically. Um, we really need to go beyond the recruitment and admissions phases um, and really look at the retention and re-enrolling of our current students. Um, those are gonna be key pieces. Uh, some of the things that I, I look at is uh, the requirement of a paradigm shift, right? We, we can't just look at this new to higher ed cohort that's going to come through our traditional K K-12 uh, pipeline and looking at those adult workers, looking at those adult workers or incumbent workers who need to reskill, retool to be uh, competitive or even um, uh, meet the baseline requirements in their, in their industry. Um, and we have demographic information that, that kind of uh, supports where our future enrollment will be coming from. Um, looking at how, how do we attract and engage uh, new student populations and markets, that's gonna be key moving forward. And uh, we're, we're gonna have to essentially leverage the technology, uh, especially during this fourth industrial revolution, leverage the technology we have, future technology, um, but at the same time, making sure that we can meet students' demand and, and adult workers 24 hours, seven days a week, um, and keep those traditional aspects of student services while we do that uh, in this virtual environment and beyond, and maintain those human connections that, that we thrive on uh, in student affairs. And, and we may say, well, what is this shift gonna be driven by, right? And it, it, it's really gonna be driven by some of the stuff or some of the initiatives the, the institution is already working on, guided pathways. That's a framework for persistence, retention and completion, right? Re-enrolling the current students that we, that we have. Um, that's gonna help us meet those enrollment goals. Um, our need to be more data-driven than ever, right? Um, student Affairs recently uh, onboarded a, a new position that's dedicated just to metrics so we can go in and really disaggregate that data, look at how we can design and implement interventions at the enrollment and student success level. Um, really strengthening and, and looking at new program and really highlighting our centers of excellence. They're really gonna be uh, the, the, the hub of quality programming and cutting edge, uh, cutting edge um, and innovative programs are gonna be offered through those centers of excellence. Um, we're gonna have to look at and how we strengthen those 
partnerships, those transfer partnerships specifically. Um, and that's some of the work that enrollment management and marketing is already doing with the U of A and looking at how do we revitalize some of those existing programs the, that we have um, and keeping in mind that we do transfer a lot of students from Pima to, to our in-state in, uh, in state four-year um, institutions. Establishing and, and, and keeping going with our community and K-12 partnerships, I think more than ever, we're gonna have to make sure that we're connecting students to our support services faster and more effectively uh, to support our students as they not only grapple with the academic uh, and, and academic side of, of their time here with us, but also some of those things that are currently happening in the world for them. Um, and lastly, um, I'll, I'll kind of close it with this continue to be innovative, creative, and be on the cutting edge for our students. That's gonna drive us to those new student populations that we have to serve, whether that's in Pima County or online, really looking at um, some of those pieces we've already discussed during Nick's presentation of, of what are those new markets that we can attract in enrollment, and then how do we serve our current students better by re-enrolling them. Um, with that, I will open it up to any questions or comments um, you may have. Are there any questions from the board? Okay, I don't see any. I, um, or it looks like Dr. Hay actually may have a question. No, I, I just want to continue to, to thank uh, David for his expert analysis and his, his attention to extraordinary detail on this. And this is a moving target that the entire nation of community colleges is, is wrestling with. And it's certainly, it's certainly something that us as a board have to keep on top of and make sure we have the numbers and then the strategies we depend upon you and Dr. Lambert uh, to to help us implement in terms of how do we keep competitive and, and keep these uh, keep the enrollments as competitive as we possibly can given all the internal and external pressures to this and it, it is David as you know and I'm, I'm kind of speaking to the audience more in view but it is it's something we have to really think about this as a business and how do we compete for those customers, which are our students, whether they're young students, old students, returning students, and what is what is a value proposition is what you said is perfectly. It, and, it, and right now, quite frankly, if Amazon got into this business, and it's a volume issue because they could offer the same content to a million people and they could win. So the, the question is, how do we increase that volume to get enough revenue to fund the big programs that we are so proud of, which it requires on hands learning that you can't do on, you know, on virtual learning. So I, I think you guys are on the right track. And I think we, the board has to really stay engaged in these numbers and looking at how we invest in specific areas to compete in these, in this, in this, it's a national uh, competition now. It's not, it's not just us versus, uh, you know, the, the local Arizona outfits, it's, it's, a inter, it's a national, if not international competition for student time and money. Yes, thank, thank you, Dr. Hay. If I could just respond really quick. Um, you know, I, I'm, what I'm optimistic about and, and what I appreciate is the board support for our centers of excellence. Those are really gonna drive us beyond the pandemic, right? Those are, those are places where we can offer everything from a micro credential all the way to that associate's degree for direct employment and even transfer opportunities. So when the chancellor talks about and, right, it's not an or, we can say we can serve population and popu population A and population B and population C and so on, right? And so those centers of excellence are really uh, uh, vital to, to the college. So I appreciate uh, all of your support for those. Ms. Ripley? Hard to unmute. Uh, yes, I, and I would just like to add, not or, um, I would add and, um, that the one thing that we do have that all of these new online companies and, you know, like Meredith said, it's not really a crazy idea that someone like Amazon can start teaching online. Um, as they crop up, the one thing we do have is quality. And I know this for a fact. Every time I talk to someone who took classes at University of Phoenix or Pima Medical Institute or Grand Canyon, um, they're always complaining about the quality, either in the education itself, in the course, or in the services, or in the, uh, the, uh, the financing of it. So I think that that's as that was a great presentation, David. 
um, it was really excellent. It helped me a lot as a new person, but as you go forward, it's, it's marketing and this is the business aspect of what we do, but, and, and stressing, I would, I would stress that you stress the quality that we have and how we, what they don't have is what we have is the centers of excellence, the hands-on learning and the in-person amazing uh, professors that we have in the faculty. So stress that because anyone can slap together an online course and hire people to read a script. So thank you for that, David. Thank you. Um, and, then I, and then I just have sort of two questions for I think future uh, reports. One is, uh, you know, we, we see that the enrollment declines are occurring. It would be great to really get an update about non-completers. What is the, you know, how are people faring in the courses on this, in this online environment? What is our failure rate? Really getting a sort of a better understanding of how that's looking, because I think the enrollment decline is only one part of the story and we really need to better understand this other part. Um, so that's, you know, if we could get that maybe for the next, for the next meeting. The other is, um, I, you know, when you, when you put up that list of all of the competitors, it just really made me, again, you know, I, I've been harping on this for five years, but how much is being spent within the Tucson marketplace to attract students to other environments, to other opportunities, uh, to really have a better understanding of what is the, what is the investment market uh, in terms of marketing and advertising that's going on. And so I think it would be, and then understanding how we really fitting into that. I mean, we're still very reliant on our old, on our brand of being the community college of Southern Arizona. Um, and so, you know, we don't spend as aggressively anywhere near as aggressively as many of the private and out-of-state colleges that are got, starting to eat our share. So how do we really begin to, you know, yes, build programs that are more responsive to what people's needs are, but also uh, maintain our target share and really communicate our value proposition in a very clear way to people living here in Southern Arizona. Because it always concerns me when people are taking on huge amounts of debt to go to a private institution, when they can do it for a quarter of the cost or less here, and uh, you know we're not reaching them or the value proposition isn't clear enough that they're willing to pay all of that extra to take it. And, you know, have a slightly accelerated program that they get out of, you know, six months sooner. So it would be good to sort of have a more maybe holistic approach or understanding maybe at a, another report about the marketing plan. And Ms. Garcia, yes. You're on mute. Okay. I would also like to see the data that shows, that specifically shows the amount of students that are taking online courses and the ones that are actually doing the hybrid and the ones that are that are in class. Because I think that makes a big difference in what we're building. So I'd like to see that data. Yeah, that, that's definitely data we, we can collect uh, as an institution for you, board member Garcia and provide All right, that. thank you. And, and Ms. Garcia, would you want to see projections as well? I mean, because in our current climate, right, there's, it's very limited. I mean, it's going to be all- I, I understand. Yes, it'd have to be, it, it'd have to be projections. Okay. As well as, okay, great. Okay. No. Are there any other questions? Okay. Hearing none, we will move along. Thank you so much. We really appreciate the insight and uh, all of the work that you're doing to attract and retain our students. Thank you. Um, next, we have our- uh, we have our reports by representatives, uh, representative to the board. We only have one report this evening, and that is from Sage uh, Fukai McCullough. Thank you, and that was great on my name. <laughs> Working on it. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Uh, okay, so for virtual adult education, ABECC partnered again with TFCU to equip students with the knowledge and skills they need to manage money effectively. The financial literacy series via Zoom is scheduled for 2-3 to 3-10. Students will learn about the benefits of getting to know how banks and credit unions work, how to budget and save, how to protect themselves from identity theft and financial values and goals. This series is open to Pima credit students as well. For virtual student life, 
a virtual Aztec Student Advisory Board is being formed from volunteer students that are willing to devote at least four hours a month towards addressing various student issues in their respective representative areas. Students are currently being recruited and the ASAB will be fully implemented by the end of January 2021. And then for virtual first year experience, there's Connect U, six virtual CU sessions via Zoom scheduled January 6th through the 13th, online CU via D2L ongoing, and then you can find more details at www.pima.edu slash connect U. And then they are also preparing for spring FYE events. And then for the Student Senate, um, the Pima Aztec Student Senate is working on furthering an online presence to develop a community to help students stay connected in an online environment. This is accomplished by using the Discord server platform. Um, they're also working on hosting the first online student summit for the spring semester. And then we have about two to four projects identified, but the main theme for our year, but the main theme is probably going to be centralized over polarization. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your report. I actually have a question. Um, could oh, yeah. you, yeah, could you tell us um, in terms of the work that the Student Senate is doing to engage students in an online environment, mm -hmm. does the Senate have the resources it needs to be able to really do that effectively and really be able to engage the broad? Yeah, so, so I think that oh, we're working on furthering social media presence because that would bring a lot more student engagement. Um, and then the Discord platform we have gained a lot of students and we have actually like little communities for clubs on there so you can go and have little group sessions with your clubs but i think it might uh we were discussing upgrading the discord platform um it does cost some money uh, and if we do invest in that uh, it would make video calls a little easier because it would run a lot smoother because right now we can't have bigger meetings on discord it's only about like six people and then the more it goes um, the less functional Discord becomes. Okay, well, I really appreciate that insight. Uh, Chancellor Lambert, if there is anything we can do to really support financially more than we're doing in any way possible, the, the initiatives of these students to really engage with the student body, um, I think that's a meaningful tool um, and um, you know help support the software that they need and the tools so that they can really have a dynamic engagement in this unique environment, that would be great. Sounds great. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, we're moving on to our next uh, item, which is the Chancellor's Report. Chancellor Lambert. Well, well, good evening, everybody, and Happy New Year. And first and foremost, I want to welcome uh, Kat Ripley to the board, and thank you for your service, and we're looking forward to working with you going forward. Also, I, uh, I want to thank, you know, our faculty and staff. So, what I've done just recently, uh, uh, the provost had in, in collaboration with the Faculty Senate and PCCA, all faculty day, which is what we do every year. And so I went there and, and did, did a welcoming for, for folks. And I really focused on addressing just the current climate of what's happening in our nation and recognizing the importance of us not losing sight, we're part of a broader community. And what happens outside of Pima impacts what happens in Pima and being sensitive to that. And also why it's so important for us to be focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and, and then uh, something, uh, especially uh, for you, uh, Ms. Ripley is I send uh, very frequently uh, uh, articles, uh, reports, around trends and current issues in higher education. So you're gonna receive lots of emails from me. If you don't wanna read it, it's okay. But if you're really interested in this, at least you have another resource uh, available to you to, to really follow along what's, what's happening in our space. Also, uh, Pima is involved with a, a program out of MIT, uh, JWell Center, and it's focused on the workforce relevance of the liberal arts. So you have some of the leading liberal arts institutions across the country really working around this issue of how do they make the liberal arts relevant uh, to, to uh, the needs of students who will need to go on to work. And so right now Pima is the only community college that's part of that uh, programming. 
And so we're very honored to be there with some of the leading uh, uh, liberal arts institutions. So it's important that we recognize the liberal arts institutions, recognize that they have to remake themselves to continue to be relevant. And I think that's important for us not to lose sight of that. That is the work that is going on around the country. The University of Arizona, the provost and I have met with their provost and their president. They are reworking their curriculum. And so as they rework their curriculum, Pima is going to have to look to realign our curriculum uh, to, to continue to pathway into the University of Arizona. We don't know what that's gonna look like yet, but that is underway. And, and so just being mindful of that. We're also part of uh, the National Reskilling and Recovery Network. And this is a work of 20 states uh, under the auspices of the National Governors Association and the American Associations of Community Colleges. So Arizona was one of the states who was accepted into, into this network. And fortunately, uh, I'm, I'm part of the, the uh, kind of Black for Better Way advisory group that involves the governor's office, uh, uh, Arizona Commerce Authority, the Office of Equal Opportunity, um, I mean, Employment Opportunity, Workforce System, and the community colleges. And, and, and fortunately, uh, Ian is part of the working group. And so he's really been playing a leading role in putting together this report. And so hopefully one day we'll be able to share this report with all of you about how do we get Arizonans back to work with a particular focus on equity. And then a companion to that, uh, I've been asked uh, by Sun Corridor to do a similar type of work here in Pima County and it's called the Recovery and Response uh, Network. Uh, we are essentially taking what has worked, the work that's happening at the state level, and we're contextualizing it here to Pima County and Southern Arizona. So we, a final draft has been produced. Uh, we're going to, so David Dore and Ian Rourke and myself are going to be sitting down with uh, uh, the folks at Sun Corridor to talk about it and then look to finalize that out. So again, once that's ready for prime time, we'll be glad to share that out and really maybe do a whole study session around it. Uh, you'll really start to see the sectors where we think the opportunity space is for Southern Arizona. You'll also see the, the types of focus that needs to be put on uh, in terms of getting people back to work. We look at uh, the uh, uh, student market, for lack of a better way to call it, in, in three, three ways. You have the individual student who with just a little brush up can go me immediately back to work. These are dislocated workers. Or you have a group who with a little bit of extra investment of time can go back to work. And then you have the, the, the last group who really needs to come back for a longer term training and education. So we build that around that and these sectors that we find here in our community. So love to share that at some point. And um, so stay tuned. Uh, so your Pima Community College is involved as a leader at the national level and at the state level and at the local level. And so we have a lot to be proud of in terms of we are thought of as a go-to institution. Also, uh, just so you're all aware, we uh, held a 10th anniversary recognition ceremony uh, as a result of the events of January 8th and, and the the murder of so many Tucsonans and, uh, and obviously the um, and, and Representative uh, Congresswoman uh, uh, Gabby Giffords. Uh, and so we try to continue to honor our, our community members, both in the larger community as well as the folks here at Pima Community College. Uh, COVID update, just real quick, um, uh, different dimensions to this. So I've received an estimate from the American Association of Community Colleges, as well as the American Council on Education on how much uh, uh, stimulus dollars Pima may receive. And I shared that information out to the board, but I'll share it for the community. It's estimated, and this is just an estimate, that Pima will receive somewhere around $22.7 million as part of that uh, uh, CARES Act II for lack of a better way to call it. Uh, and that what is likely to happen is about 5.3 million, just shy of 5.4 million will need to be allocated to students directly. And very much in a similar way as we did the first round. 
And then the remainder, college will have a little more flexibility to use those dollars to, to make up for losses in tuition revenue, as an example, uh, and some other things. But we're still waiting for the finalization and all of this. And as well as we are in the process of finalizing out a report from the last round of stimulus dollars. And so I think I shared uh, some of that data about how we've already spent the dollars. So we will be submitting that because that's a condition of, upon getting this next round of dollars being submitted to the college. As you all know, um, uh, Chuck Huckleberry has, has recently published uh, a, a memorandum to the community about how the vaccination uh, process is gonna roll out. And, and also the University of Arizona uh, is going to be an important player in, in that mix. So I'll give you an example. Uh, Dr. Robbins just recently uh, announced that they are likely going to be the administer, administering the vaccinations for all of the public education entities in Pima County, or at least minimally be the, the site for that. And so fortunately Pima is in 1B. And when they say 1B, uh, I've heard, I've seen just a reference to teachers. I've seen the reference to teachers and staff. Uh, I think ultimately what that means is I think any of our employees uh, that we, we, we recommend to them that those would be the folks who would be in 1B. Dr. Robbins uh, indicated during his presentation that this is not a one or two week and get everybody uh, inoculated, it's going to be weeks and months, uh, that, uh, a process. So I ask everyone's patience as we go through this process. And right now the goal is to be at 12,000 a week. And, uh, and, uh, but uh, that's not going to get to the ultimate goal that the county has set. And that is to vaccinate about three quarters uh, of a million of our residents. And then as you know, there's a group of residents that they're not factoring into that equation. So those that are 18 and under, as well as uh, the folks who for religious reasons or some other reasons prefer not to be vaccinated. So, so about 80% of the population roughly will be uh, hopefully vaccinated by the time we get through the balance of, of uh, hopefully through the summer and maybe more realistically even later than that. Uh, students are not mentioned sp expressly in, in our context. And so, so, that, so it's not clear if students would be part of that mix or not. Uh, but if students fall into the other categories that have been identified, certainly they would fall into those pieces. So, but we'll be paying attention to all of those pieces as we, as we go forward. And so again, I just wanna thank everybody at the college for all that you do uh, together. We have done tremendous things, especially during this very, very challenging year. This has been probably the most challenging year any of us are ever going to face uh, as a collective. And, and I think it's through all of us working together that we become a key part of the recovery of this community. People are looking to Pima Community College to be a big part of that. So thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Lambert. And I, and I just wanna say thank you for all of your leadership and work in making sure that the college remains relevant and part of the recovery. Uh, it's, it's been a huge lift and I really appreciate all of the time and energy and effort you have put in to keeping the ship steering you know, in the right direction. So thank you. Um, before we move on to our information items, I, uh, I am, was remiss. I wanted to welcome Jeff Thies, who is gonna serve on our uh, representative to the board as a um, uh, the administrative uh, representative. Um, so welcome, we look forward to uh, hearing from you next week and hope you can give an introduction then uh, when it's on the agenda, but we're uh, thrilled that you will be uh, on the um, new representative uh, board to the board. Thank you. Um, next, we have our information items. Uh, Mr. Sylvan, if you could read the information items, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So these are uh, information items, are written materials that were provided to the board to help uh, provide it with some context for its work. Uh, normally we have clarifying questions if necessary, but generally if there's any board member who would like to have a discussion or ask substantive questions, then please let us know and we will notice that topic for uh, a discussion at a regular follow-up board meeting. So the information items, 
uh, pertinent to this meeting were the October 2020 financial statements, a list of administrative procedure changes. Those, the topics that were covered included those that address the development and revision of board policies and administrative procedures, essentially. Open. Ms. Garcia has a question. You're muted though. Ms. Garcia, you're muted. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I wasn't sure when I could bring this up but I would like to table administrative procedure changes AP 1.01.01, also AP 1.01.02, and AP 3.25.05, and 3.4606, and 4.01.04. So, um there is no process to do that. So, so information items are not being presented the, to the board for action. They're being um, shared as that's what it is for information items. So the board uh, creates, revises board policies, but administrative procedures are how the administration um, uh, sets the parameters in order to implement board policies. So um, we could certainly notice for a further discussion to find out if there are particular concerns or questions to be addressed, but these items are not actually being presented to the board for approval at this time. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm like, so I'm after me, perhaps after me, I'm happy to chat with you about the issues and can figure out how to, how to get them on the, on the agenda. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Uh, so the, uh, the AP change topics, like I mentioned, were, is, are the two that deal with the development and revision of board policies and administrative procedures. Uh, there's one concerning how program and service review are conducted. There is one related to the pr process that students with disabilities uh, follow when they have a complaint. And finally, there is one about the administration of grants at the college. Uh, the next administrative, excuse me, information item is employment information that contains uh, information about two new hires, uh, three retirements, and a number of separations. Also included is the list of individuals who have been certified as qualified to serve as adjunct faculty at Pima Community College. We can item have that one. We can go on with that one. I'm sorry, pardon me? I said, well, you you can go ahead and just present information on that one. I don't need to listen to that one. For information when you when we get together. Oh, okay. Um, item 6.5 is the list of positions that are subject to the change in wage because of the annual increase in the Arizona minimum wage. Item 6.6 .6 is uh, information about an extension of the um, Veterans Upward Bound grant that's uh, at East Campus. Uh, there's an additional year at that grant, which is uh, a little over $260,000 in support of uh, veterans related services. Item 6.7 is information about a $100,000 grant from a private entity, the Education Lab, to support development of uh, new educational pathways at Pima College. And finally, we have item 6.8, which relates to the modification of a grant that Pima College received from the United States Department of Health and Human Services that supports opportunities uh, for students studying in the health professions. Essentially the parameters of the goals uh, for this year, the grant were modified to reflect um, certain realities of the COVID situation. Thank you very much, Mr. Sylvan. If um, the next item on the agenda is the consent agenda, if you could read the consent items, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the items that are on the consent agenda for consideration and approval of the board, and just because we have a new member for procedural uh, purposes, if there is a particular item uh, that any board member would like to have the subject of separate discussion, um, you can let me know and we'll pull it from the vote uh, when I, so that uh, we'll do the consent agenda as a block. But if there's a specific item that a board member would like to discuss and have a separate vote on, uh, please let me know and, and we'll uh, modify our process accordingly. So uh, with that introduction, the items on the consent agenda uh, for the board this evening are the approval of minutes from a number of meetings, uh, the October 26 study session, the October 26th executive session, the November 4th executive session, the November 4th regular meeting, and the December 7th study session. 
That's items 7.1 through 7.5. Item 7.6 is a proposed amendment to the Charter of the Finance and Audit Committee. Essentially, this would clarify the length of committee member terms, specifically referring to the uh, community members who serve on that uh, board committee. Item 7.7 7 is uh, a one-year extension to a, uh, an agreement that Pima College has with the University of Arizona that allows Pima College students to participate in um, some astronomy related programs with the university. The amount of the award is slightly over $93,000. Item 7.8 is to modify an agreement that uh, Pima College has with Maricopa Community College for training through its chair academy program. It's be an increase in the training uh, being offered and the amount of that increase is $75 hundred dollars. Item 7.9 uh, is amendments to a series of dual enrollment, enrollment, excuse me, agreements with a number of uh, public charter school and private schools uh, uh, in the county. Uh, the specific amendments are attached to the board materials. It's basically adding courses at a number of schools. Those in, uh, include Flowing Wells High School, Mountain View High School, Tankaverde High School, Rincon High School, Tucson Magnet, uh, Cienega High School, the Mountain View at JTED, uh, two charter schools, Alta Vista Charter High School, Presidio High School, and then a private school, the Abbey School. Item 7.10 is an intergovernmental agreement with the Mesa School District uh, in order to allow uh, Pima students in our teacher certification program to uh, perform the 12 week teaching requirement at that school district. Item 7.11 is an amendment to a construction contract with Kittle Design and Construction that's doing uh, work at the West Campus. This is to add an additional restroom facility and, uh, excuse me, and the amount of that uh, uh, contract increase would be not to exceed $318,133. And finally, item 7.12 is authorization for the chancellor to execute an easement with uh, Pima County for uh, an additional sewer connection at the down, on the downtown campus that will support the advanced manufacturing building facility that we are in the process of constructing. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, second from Ms. Ripley. Um, all in favor? Well, let's do a roll call vote, Mr. Sylvan. All right, uh, certainly Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Ripley? Yes, aye. <laughs> Mr. Klinko? Yes. Ms. Garcia? Yes. Dr. Hay? Yes. Mr. Gonzalez? Oh, Mr. Gonzalez, you're muted. Looks like you're getting yes. an but if not, okay, yes. So uh, <laughs> uh, look to pass it unanimously. Um, and also um, for Ms. Ripley, uh, you know, if there's ever anything on the consent agenda, uh, you know, it's also great. You can, you can reach out to both uh, Chancellor Lambert or, um, or myself and, um, and ahead of time, you can get questions answered um, on, any of these, on any of these topics um, or you can um, ask that it be pulled um, so staff is ready to be able to give a formal presentation on the topic. So that's usually very helpful. Okay, um, we have no action items this evening. Finally, is our request for future agenda items. Yes. Ms. Garcia. I motion, make a motion that we amend, that we review, okay, how do I do this? Your, request for amendments of bylaws and article four, amendments of bylaw and, uh, God, I think I got this one more. And then article nine, which is the officers, Bylaws. There should okay. be two of them. Okay, so we've received that, and per the bylaws, we will have that agendized on our next uh, at our next meeting in February. Okay. Um, are there any other future agenda items? Okay. Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. Everyone, have a great evening.